You know, there's really only two religions, and both really all depend on one thing. One religion that we all should know is, of course, the religion of works. What can you? What have you done, or what will you do to uh, to earn salvation, to earn redemption? And then uh, the other is, of course, a fact of the matter that Jesus Christ has done it all. And with that, uh, I really want to uh, piggyback off something we did about a month ago. Uh, in uh, Exodus chapter uh, 19. We're going to be here for just for a minute, literally one minute, then we're going over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. So if you want to go ahead, go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You are more than welcome. Uh, in Exodus chapter um, 19, we find that the Bible says, And therefore, uh, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my commandment, then you shall be a special treasure uh, to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be uh, to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, that uh, the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, Father, I simply just, Father, I am so overwhelmed by your glory. Father, I thank you for all that you have done. Father, I pray that you would just to uh, be that God to us that you have promised us. And Father, with this, if there be anything that is wrong between us, something that's just not right, uh, maybe it's a, a secret sin, maybe it's a, a willful disobedience, or maybe it's the fact that we, we really don't know you. Father, I ask that today would be that day that you would speak to our hearts. And Father, as you speak to our hearts, all things would be made clear. For it's your name we ask and we pray. Amen. So as we look there, uh, we found uh, where it said uh, the word, uh, it's one of those words that every woman does not want to hear when they go through, um, uh, through marriage, uh, premarital counseling. What's that word, ladies? Oh, I got one. They, they knew it. Yeah. No, I don't want to hear that word, right? I remember uh, one time I was um, I was uh, getting ready to do this uh, this wedding, and the funny thing was I knew uh, the the boy, and I still I look at him still today as a boy, even though uh, he's taller than Caleb now. Uh, he compared to me. You know how big that is, right? Uh, but I, I knew him when he was like a three-year-old little kid, right? And I saw him grow up, and I, I knew uh, the woman that uh, that God had given him, and uh, I knew she was raised in church. Uh, her dad was a little rough, but uh, he was doing everything he could to be in church every chance he got. And uh, she was raised in church. I, I get ready to go and do their marital premarital counseling, and she says, you can say anything you want, but never bring up the word obey. And I was like, but you don't understand. Nope, don't want to hear it. So it is, we had to go around it a different way. But when we look at that word, when we look in the Hebrew, that word is the word shema. It, it very easy to uh, pronounce. It's S-H-E-M-A, uh, -E shema. And, and uh, with that, that, that is something that, that we need to understand that the very first thing that God says for us to be a kingdom of priests is the very fact that we are to obey him. And with that, uh, the Lord uh, would give us a little bit more there in Deuteronomy where he would use the exact same word. And if you, uh, if you talk to, uh, to Jews today and, they, and you ask them, what do they live by? They're going to live by this, these verses right here. And if you want to know, here's a funny thing. A lot of those Orthodox Jews, those who don't believe in Jesus, they will also cite this next verse uh, as a way of saying that Jesus could not be God. So here we go. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we're going to show you why they are wrong to an extent. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the Lord, uh, the Lord our God, 
The Lord is one. That, that, that's where they're going to go to. Now let's read the rest of what it says. These words should ring true to you. Uh, verse 5. Uh, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, uh, with all your soul, and with all your strength. How many of you guys have heard that one before? Verse 6. These words which I command you today, you shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall walk, uh, you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. Uh, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall, uh, they shall be uh, frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. So as we look here, we're looking at what is called the Shema. Now, now why, why did I say that? Well, when we look there, uh, there in uh, Ex or Exodus chapter 19, uh, we found right there uh, this simple fact that, that God is saying, you are now to be a new nation. You are to be a kingdom of priests. You are now mine, and you have things that you will have to do. And the first thing is to shema, to obey. Now, as we look at that, to obey, we need to understand a little bit more. That word doesn't just mean what we would call obey. It also means the first word here in what is called the shema. It is the word hear. So how can we obey something if we don't hear it? That ought to get you to this simple point of the matter of uh, what does the word say? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Why? Because that is that Shema. To obey, you must hear. And what is God saying here? He says there in verse 4, I hear Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God is, uh, the Lord is one. So as we look there, we find that word Lord is the word Yahweh. That is the unspeakable name of God. Uh, that, that's what they say. Now, here's a great thing. Just, just because we did that song earlier, I give this to you. Uh, you find that there on the cross, why were the Pharisees and the Sadducees mad? Uh, do you really know why? Here's why. Because, remember when oh, uh, uh, Pilate wrote down himself in three languages... Uh, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. He wrote down what Jesus' charge was, and he did it in Hebrew. And why not just Aramaic? Because he wrote Hebrew A was the, the language of the people, yes, but B because the very first words or letters of each of those words in Hebrew wrote the name of God. It wrote Yahweh. It wrote Yahweh, however you want to pronounce it. That, so we find that the Romans were proclaiming Jesus was God. That's just because you came today. Now you're welcome. But when we look there, we find that that word Yahweh means the existing one, the one that existed before time. Remember what Isaiah said, or uh, what the Lord told Isaiah. Isaiah, he told him, before the, me there was nothing. After me there will be nothing. Why? Because he is the existent one. He has always been, and he will for always be. And that's the thing that we need to understand. He is the eternal one. And with that, that bears in us a very sense of the term of relationship with him. If you were not a child of God, you feel there is something missing inside of you. Before you were a child of God, you Christian, you realized there was something missing inside of you. What was that that was missing? That that was missing was Yahweh. It was your Lord. That in His Lordship, we find that there we have more than we could ever imagine. As Lord, He is your protector. He is your provider. And then you find there that he says, the Lord, our God. I'm glad he didn't say the Lord, the God. He says, our God, why? Our means there is a sense of relationship. See, 
in your life, there is a relationship that you are expected to have with Him. That relationship is not just between the hours of 10 and 11 on a Sunday morning or 11 and 12 on a Sunday morning. That is not the relationship that you are to have with the Lord God Almighty. Why? Why is that? Because to have a true relationship, we must understand that we are being courted by the Almighty. He has given us 66 love letters that He says one specific thing, and that is is that I love you. I have done all for you so that you can have peace, so that you can have understanding. And they, therefore we find that he's not just the God, he's just not a God, but he is uh, our God. He is that that we have placed before us, and as we have placed him before us, we are not to have anything in front of him. And by the way, if you have anything in front of him, if you are putting anything in front of him, it does not matter what it is. To you, that is your God, not him. He says, our God. Nothing goes before him. Remember, rule one. Rule one in the Ten Commandments. The, uh, the, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the bondages uh, of Egypt. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. And as we look at this, he says, I am to be your God. I am going to be this for you. You don't need any other gods. You don't need any other things. I have done everything you need. But he's our God. That word is the word Elohim. When you look in your Bible, you can go, uh, Genesis 1-1, we remember that. It says, in the beginning, what's the next word? God. You guess what that word is? This word here. It's Elohim. Now, as we look at this word Elohim, it means the supreme God. He's not just a God. He is our God. But as our God, he is also the supreme God. As the supreme God, uh, we find that he is the one that is to judge everything. Ouch. How many of you guys are going to say ouch on that one? You see, preacher, uh, I messed up this week, and I didn't do everything that I was supposed to. Well, you're, you're under his judgment, not mine. But, but you see, I really messed up. There, there's no way that I can get out of this. You know what? Neither could I. That's the reason he sent his son to die on the cross for you. So you could have relief from the judgment of Elohim. We find there, if you'll remember, in Genesis 1-1, as God, he says, in the beginning, God created. So as God created, that means he is the creator God. He created all things. And how do we know that? Because if he didn't, then you would have to believe in something called chaos theory. Chaos theory says this, everything happened by accident. In a lot of cases, that's what's taught in the schools. No wonder our kids act the way they do. You were not an accident. You were created by an almighty God. What you were going through is not just an accident. It was preordained by an almighty God. He knew all things, and he knew those things because he loved you. And he loves you, and he will continue to love you. He says there, the Lord your God, our God, uh, the Lord is one. Now, as you look at that word one, that word is akad. And this is where uh, the Orthodox Jew and the Christian have their split. This is where they, that we get all mixed up between the two of us. Because uh, the Orthodox Jew, when they look at this word akad, they, 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 they automatically uh, assume, and they're wrong, because there's another word for what they're assuming. Uh, it's yakad instead of ekad. And that, that, that word that for one means, that this it means uh, not only does it mean one it means to be first the Lord is to be first in your life if the Lord is not first he's not on your list if you're not waking up and worship him first then you're not serving the right God if you're not thinking everything through a gospel lens through the Lord Jesus Christ then you're not serving the one true God you are serving a God that you have made up. It says one. That means first. It does mean one, 
But, but Yekod means the only, but we find he is the one God. But why is that? Because you go back uh, to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Uh, we look there again. We find Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was, uh, was a void. And then we find that the Spirit of God hovered on the face of the deep. We find there the Trinity. We find the three phases of who God is. He is God, the supreme God. He is, remember John 1, 1, uh, all things were created through him, and without him nothing was created. So there is Jesus Christ. And then verse 2, who's hovering over the chaos? The Holy Spirit. He's still God. Amen. He's still God. What does that mean? To these Hebrew people, this means this. At this time, there are already plenty of gods. They had just been in a pantheistic society there in Egypt where they worshipped every single... They even worshipped a beetle. How many of you guys are going to worship that beetle that walks up your, the, your wall? That's how crazy they were. Guess what? When you get in the world, you're going to worship crazy things. And when you get older, you're going to say, why did I do that? Why did I make that decision? Because you were believing crazy things. It's the believing in the one true God. But now the Lord knows that they are going to go into a new land. They are going to be faced with about four different main gods. Number one would be Baal. You guys know who Baal is. You ever heard of that guy? Remember Elijah, they're, they're jumping around, trying to get Baal to wake up or get off the get out of the, the bathroom or whatever. The, the, those idiots are cutting themselves, hooping and hollering, uh, pretty much dying of blood loss, uh, and he never shows up. Or Ashroth. Ashroth, uh, that, that, is the, that was supposed to be Baal's wife. And, and what you did for that, she was a fertility god. And, and the way that you would make sure that you got, you got rain is to make uh, Baal's wife happy, and you would do that by killing your children. And you say, well, that's just barbaric. Do you realize that over 60 million kids in America have died out of convenience? Moloch. Moloch was another one they were going to have to face. Another one of those where they would, they would sacrifice their children. How many kids maybe not have died in the womb but, but have been sacrificed for convenience today because mom and dad just give them something they say, here, be happy, get out of my hair. Because they're serving other gods. We find here the Shema, the Lord our God. The Lord is one there are no others after him. The last one they would have to face would be a one. He would change his name later. But, by, but his name is so poignant at this point in time. His name was Sin. He was the moon god. He was represented by a crescent moon with a star. Put, the, put them together, you'll know what you mean. These were gods that they were going to face. These were gods that they were going to be tempted by. And here's the thing. You and I are tempted by these same ones. But we must understand, to be a kingdom of priests, to be people that are obeying the word of God, we must understand, number one, that the Lord is our God and there is no other one. Any other God you have in your life, any other thing that you put in front of him, that is a false God and must be repented of. And no, I'm not sorry for saying that. So here we go. All that introduction. What does the Shema do to us? Why does it matter to us? Well, we just went through, well, he's Lord, he's God, there's no other one, it's just him. Uh, he's shown in three different persons, but it's just him. Yeah, we get that. But let's see what he's told us. If you remember uh, when uh, the, the old lawyer comes up to Jesus and says, well, what's the greatest commandment? Well, Jesus, 
being A, a good rabbi, being B, a good Jew, being C, God himself, just quotes what he said before to Moses. What did he say? Uh, he said this right here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, as we look at that, we need to understand what that means. We need to understand what he's talking about. So, so as we look at what does it mean, and number one, it means that we are to love, not hate. You see, what Christians today, too many times, what we are uh, deemed by is the things we are against. Are we against a lot of things? People think we are. We're not dictated by what we're for. What are we for? The love of God. It says right there, you shall love the Lord your God. So, so as you look there, uh, we find in verse 5, he was our God. Here uh, we find it's your God. Why? As we look at that, we look at the word love, that, that word is abed. It means to have affection. Uh, so uh, affection for this God. How long has it been since you have truly shown and since you have truly experienced the love of God that no matter what goes on, you know that you love Him. You know that He's there. You know that you all you want to do is simply go out and worship Him like nobody else. I take it back to, uh, to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 2. How many of you guys have ever read Matthew chapter 2? Okay, some of you passed. Good. All right, so as we look there, Matthew chapter 2, we all know the Magi, the wise men. Now, we do not know how many there were, uh, but we can tell you from your Old Testament, there were at least five of them, plus all of their entourage. No wonder uh, Herod was upset, because you've got a rival kingdom coming in here looking for a new king. But as we look there, what do we find? We find that they go to uh, Jerusalem. Why not? That's where the king's supposed to, to reside, right? How many of you guys would think that off the bat? King should be, in the, uh, should be at the capital. If there's a new baby born, it's supposed to be king. He should be at the capital. Well, that's what you would have thought. That's what they thought. So they took their eyes off the star, and they went into the capital. And guess what they don't find? The king. They leave, they're worried, I would say, that they know roughly where they're going, but then they see the star again, and as they see the star, they go into Bethlehem, because we know Malachi, or uh, Micah tells us, uh, uh, they're in Bethlehem, that's where he would be born, they go to Bethlehem, uh, they go in, they see the child, it's very important that he's a child, he's not a baby, he's a child at this point, he's older than in, Luke, uh, in Luke's gospel, and as they go there, we need to understand who he is. Okay, this is baby Jesus. How many people had he healed? Right? How many had he raised from the dead? Are the nail prints in his hands yet? Are the vertebrae showing because of the beating that he got? Has his beard been ripped out? None of that. But the Bible says something very beautiful there. What does it say? They worshipped him. In that worship, it's not because of everything that he had done, because he's not done them. They worship him simply because he is who he is. How long has it been since you worshipped him simply because he is who he is? In our prayers, primarily here's the prayer that we're going to pray. We're going to, we're going to open up, we're going to thank him for this or that, and then we're going to go into our prayer, we're going to ask him to, to do these things, and we're going to say, in Jesus' name, amen, and then we're going to go on. How many of you guys, that's a normal prayer, right? Prayer is so much more. Prayer is an act of worship. You are showing your affection for this one that has done everything for you because he's God. He's the Lord. He's our God. He is the Lord, your God. And because of that, we are to love him with an affection an affection that is so much more than we could ever fathom. 
If you don't get anything today, let me just say this. If you can do one thing the rest of this coming week, do this. Simply love the Lord with the affection that is due Him. Let me tell you, your life will be changed. It's a love that is an affection. It's a love that is intimate. This uh, Ahab is to be intimate. Intimate meaning that he knows everything about you. Now, when I was over there this last week, uh, uh, I think Tuesday, Wednesday, I got preached to uh, literally in a two-day period about eight different sermons. Do you know what that does to, uh, to a preaching junkie? I mean, it was really, it was awesome. But in looking and looking at that and looking at the, this very fact that there are different ways in which we look at God and looking at different ways in which we try to be intimate with Him. Let me tell you, if you're not intimate with the Almighty God, you're serving the wrong God. This is one that said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. This is the one that when you are down and out and there's nothing you can do to get out of it, that he'll reach his way down and will pick you up, clean you up, and put you where you need to be. This is the one when your heart is broken and you, the words don't even come out that the, that the Bible says that even the groanings of your soul are understand, understood by the Almighty. That's intimate. You could go to him with everything. And he's there. And here's the thing. I was reading. I want to say it was, uh, it was in Guzik. Guzik uh, likened it to this. He said, and just as the way in which uh, the Lord loves us, he expects us to love him the exact same way. That's an amen or that's an oh me. This love that we are to have is to be a desire. No wonder David said, I was happy when they said it was time to go to the house of the Lord. David's son died. His little baby died. And what did he do? He got cleaned up and he went to the house of the Lord. You got, uh, you got oh, uh, see, Mary, Martha, and they're mourning the loss of their brother, this one that took care of them. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is in town. What do they do? They go meet him because they had a desire to see him. You got Zechariah and Elizabeth. They, they've went uh, some 70, 80, 90 years. They're old. They haven't had any kids. They've been met with nothing but heartache and trepidation their entire lives. But did that stop them from serving an almighty God? No. Why? Because they loved him. They had a desire to be near him. And if you don't have that desire to be near him, then you've got something wrong. It's a love. This love is more than just a feeling. I was talking to somebody. They went to a church right down the road, checked it out because they wanted to check it out. And it was all about feeling. You ever been in those services where the, the preacher or the songs, they manipulated you into feeling a certain way? I'm not saying that you can't get saved in that, but I can tell you this. It's not the same as feeling the almighty love and power of God right there. I remember one time, is is back before I pastored in uh, Athens. I was the uh, uh, the chaplain for uh, 
this nursing home in town. We had three of them in town. I, I was chaplain at one, went there every Sunday morning. I believe it was about 8 o'clock. I'd get there, and I'd preach to them. I would talk to them. Uh, I would try to counsel with them. Every Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, I was there. I remember this one December uh, day. It was still dark uh, because it's December. It was raining. It was icky, and it was cold. Who did not want to be there that day, that morning? And I remember just sitting there in the vehicle. Had just turned it off from sitting there. I just have real time with the Lord. Tell him how I felt. Tell him what I needed. You know what I felt after that? A calmness in the loving arms of the one that desires me more than anything else I could ever have. He's real. Let me say that again. He's real. And he loves you with such a desire that he longs for you to have that same love. For him. Love the Lord with all your hearts. What does that mean? The word heart there means all your courage, all your mind, and all your soul. You see, when we love the Lord with all of our heart, we will be changed. And if you're not being changed, then are you loving him with all your heart? It says love with all your soul. What does that mean? That's your breath. That's what you have inside you. That is the pleasure that you have. Your pleasure should be to be in the heart of Christ. With all your strength. That means holy, loving Him. See, sometimes we don't understand why things happen. Sometimes life happens. Got to get an amen on that one. And we're like Job, sitting in the ashes, wondering what just happened. But it's even in those ashes that Job loved the Lord with all his strength. Because he wholly loved God. He said something there uh, against his friends that he said, Even though the Lord may slay me, I know my Redeemer lives. Why? Because he wholly loved the Lord. That no matter what happened in his life, he was going to love and be loved by the Almighty. He loved, that. this word uh, for all your strength means to love in abundance. That's why David said, my cup runneth over. And over in abundance of the love of God. This word strength, I love this one. We're, we're getting ready to close. This, this word strength means that we are to love out loud. Strength means loudness. Do you love the Lord out loud? Well, I'll wear my Jesus fish on my shirt, preacher. Isn't that good enough? No. When we love him with all our heart, we're going to be changed. We love him with all of our soul. Our pleasure will only be in him. When we love him with all our strength, we're going to live that love out loud to a lost and dying world. That all may know that Jesus is your king. Are you ready to obey him? If there is something that, that the Lord has shown you where he's not that Lord, your God, 
where you're not loving him with your whole heart that you've been changed, that, that you're not loving him with your whole soul, is that everything about you, everything in your essence is about him or your strength, that you're living that out loud. Then as we get ready to pray, it's your time to pray. You don't listen to the bald-headed guy. You don't repeat what the bald-headed guy says. You pray. Here we go. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, Lord, I love you. Father, in those places in my life where maybe I'm not having that total love, Father, show those to me. Father, show those to us. Lord, be Lord of our life. Change us where we need to be changed. Change our desires where they need to be changed to be totally in line with you. Father, love us and help us to love you. We'll love all of our heart, all of our essence. With everything that we are, help us to, to, to love you. And Father, those places right now that we are harboring the, those, those hurts or those anger, that bitterness. Father, right now that, that, that you've shown us those things. Father, right now just let, have us to give those to you. As an act of love and worship. Father, help us to live a love for you out loud. And help us as we live that love for you out loud. Help us to be more intimate with you. Help us to have a better relationship with you. Father, help us to seek and desire fellowship with you. For it's in your name that I ask and that I humbly pray. Amen. As we stand and we sing.